Chapter Seventeen of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: The Punishment. The scene we are about to describe took place in a room hung with red and brilliantly lighted. Rodolph, clothed in a long dressing gown of black velvet, which increased the pallor of his features, was seated before a large table covered with a green cloth on this table was the schoolmaster's pocket-book the pinchbeck chain of the chouette to which was suspended the little saint esprit of lapis lazuli the blood-stained stiletto with which murphy had been stabbed the crowbar with which the door had been forced and the five notes of a thousand francs each which the chourineur had fetched out of the next apartment the negro doctor was seated at one side of the table the chourineur on the other the schoolmaster tightly bound with cords and unable to move a limb was placed in a large armchair on casters in the middle of the salon the people who had brought in this man had withdrawn and rodolph the doctor the chourineur and the assassin were left alone rodolph was no longer out of temper but calm sad and collected he was about to discharge a solemn self-imposed and important duty the doctor was lost in meditation the chourineur felt an indescribable fear he could not take his eyes off rodolph the schoolmaster's countenance was ghastly he was in an agony of fear the most profound silence reigned within nothing was heard but the splash splash of the rain without as it fell from the roof on to the pavement rodolph addressed the schoolmaster anselme durenel you have escaped from the bang at rochefort where you were condemned for life for forgery robbery and murder it's false said the schoolmaster in a hollow voice and looking about him with his restless and glaring glance you are anselme durenel and you murdered and robbed a cattle dealer on the road to poissy it's a lie you shall confess it presently the scoundrel looked at rodolph with an air of astonishment this very night you came here to rob and you have stabbed the master of this house it was you who suggested this robbery assuming an air of assurance i was attacked and i defended myself the man you stabbed did not attack you he was unarmed true i did suggest this robbery to you i'll tell you why last night only after having robbed a man and a woman in the cite you offered to kill me for a thousand francs i heard him said the chourineur the schoolmaster darted at him a glance of deadliest hate rodolph continued you see there was no occasion to tempt you to do mischief you are not my judge and i will not answer you another question i'll tell you why i propose this robbery to you i knew you were a runaway convict you know the parents of the unfortunate girl all whose misfortunes have been caused by your miserable accomplice the chouette i wish to draw you here by the temptation of a robbery because this was the only temptation that could avail with you once in my power i leave you the choice of being handed over to the hands of justice which will make you pay with your head the assassination of the cattle dealer it is false i did not commit that crime or of being conducted out of france under my direction to a place of perpetual confinement where your lot will be less painful than that at the bang but i will only allow you this relaxation of punishment on condition that you give me the information which i desire to acquire condemned for life you have broken away from your confinement and by seizing upon you and placing you hereafter beyond the possibility of doing injury i serve society and from your confession i may perhaps find the means of restoring to her family a poor creature much more unfortunate than guilty this was my first intention it was not legal but your escape and your fresh crimes forbid any such course on my part now and place you beyond all law yesterday by a remarkable revelation i discovered that you are anselme duranel it's false i am not called duranel rodolph took from the table the chain of the chouette and pointing to the little saint esprit of lapis lazuli said in a threatening voice sacrilege you have prostituted to an infamous wretch this holy relic thrice holy for your infant boy had this pious gift from his mother and grandmother the schoolmaster dumbfounded at this discovery lowered his head and made no response you carried off your child from his mother fifteen years ago and you alone possessed the secret of his existence i had in this an additional motive for laying hands on you when i had detected who you were i seek no revenge for what you have done to me personally but to-night you have again shed blood without provocation 
the man you have assassinated came to you in full confidence not suspecting your sanguinary purpose he asked you what you wanted your money or your life and you stabbed him with your poniard so m murphy said when i first came to his aid said the doctor it's false he lied murphy never lies said rodolph calmly your crimes demand a striking reparation you came into this garden forcibly you stabbed a man that you might rob him you have committed another murder you ought to die on this spot but pity respect for your wife and son they shall save you from the shame of a scaffold it will be said that you were killed in a brawl with weapons in your hand prepare the means for your punishment are at hand rodolph's countenance was implacable the schoolmaster had remarked in the next room two men armed with carbines his name was known he thought they were going to make away with him and bury in the shade of his later crimes and thus spare his family the new opprobrium like his fellows this wretch was as cowardly as he was ferocious thinking his hour was come he trembled and cried mercy no mercy for you said rodolph if your brains are not blown out here the scaffold awaits you i prefer the scaffold i shall live at least two or three months longer why why should i be punished at once mercy mercy but your wife your son they bear your name my name is dishonoured already if only for eight days let me live in mercy do not even that contempt of life which is sometimes displayed by the greatest criminals said rodolph with disgust besides the law forbids any one to take justice into their own hands said the schoolmaster with assurance the law the law exclaimed rodolph do you dare to invoke the law you who have always lived in open revolt and constant enmity against society the ruffian bowed his head and made no answer then added in a more humble tone at least for pity's sake spare my life will you tell me where your son is yes yes i will tell you all i know will you tell me who are the parents of the young girl whose childhood the chouette made one scene of torture in my pocket-book there are papers which will put you on the track of the persons who gave her to the chouette where is your son will you let me live first make a full confession and then when i have told you all said the schoolmaster with hesitation you have killed him no no i have confided him to one of my accomplices who when i was apprehended effected his escape what did he do with him he brought him up and gave him an education which fitted him to enter into a banking-house at nantes so that we might get information manage an introduction to the banker and so facilitate our plans although at rochefort and preparing for my escape i arranged this plan and corresponded in cipher with my friend oh mon dieu his child his son this man appalls me cried rodolph with horror and hiding his head between his hands but it was only a forgery that we thought exclaimed the scoundrel and when my son was informed what was expected of him he was indignant told all to his employer and quitted nantes you will find in my pocket-book notes of all the steps taken to discover his traces the last place we ascertained he had lived in was the rue du temple where he was known under the name of francois germain the exact address is also in my pocket-book you see i do not wish to conceal anything i have told you everything i know now keep your promise i only ask you to have me taken into custody for this night's robbery and the cattle merchant at poissy that affair can never be brought to light there are no proofs i own it to you in proof of the sincerity with which i am speaking but before any other person i should deny all knowledge of the business you confess it then do you i was destitute without the smallest means of living the chouette instigated me to do it but now i sincerely repent ever having listened to her i do indeed ah would you but generously save me from the hands of justice i would promise you most solemnly to forsake all such evil practices for the future be satisfied your life shall be spared neither will i deliver you into the hands of the law do you then pardon me 
exclaimed the schoolmaster as though doubting what he heard can it be can you be so generous as to forgive i both judge you and award your sentence cried rodolph in a solemn tone i will not surrender you to the power of the laws because they would condemn you to the galleys or the scaffold and that must not be no for many reasons the galleys would but open a fresh field for the development of your brutal strength and villainy which would soon be exercised in endeavouring to obtain domination over the guilty or unfortunate beings you would be associated with to render yourself a fresh object of horror or of dread for even crime has its ambition and yours has long consisted in a pre-eminence in vicious deeds and monstrous vices while your iron frame would alike defy the labours of the oar or the chastisement of those set over you and the strongest chains may be broken the thickest wall pierced through steep ramparts have been scaled before now and you might one day burst your yoke and be again let loose upon society like an infuriated beast marking your passage with murder and destruction for none would be safe from your herculean strength or from the sharpness of your knife therefore such consequences must be avoided but since the galleys might fail to stop your infamous career how is society to be preserved from your brutal violence the scaffold comes next in consideration it is my life then you seek cried the ruffian my life oh spare it peace coward hope not that i mean so speedy a termination to your just punishment no your eager craving after a wretched existence would prevent you from suffering the agony of anticipated death and far from dwelling upon the scaffold and the block your guilty soul would be filled with schemes of escape and hopes of pardon neither would you believe you were truly doomed to die till in the very grasp of the executioner and even in that terrible moment it is probable that brutalized by terror you would be a mere mass of human flesh offered up by justice as an expiatory offering to the manes of your victims that mode of settling your long and heavy accounts will not half pay the debt no poor wretched trembling craven we must devise a more terrific method of atonement for you at the scaffold i repeat you would cling to hope while one breath remained within you wretch that you are you would dare to hope you who have denied all hope and mercy to so many unhappy beings no no unless you repent and that with all your heart for the misdeeds of your infamous life i would in this world at least shut out from you the faintest glimmer of hope what man is this what have i ever done to injure him whence comes he thus to torture me where am i asked the schoolmaster in almost incoherent tones and nearly frantic with terror rodolph continued if even you could meet death with a man's courage i would not have you ascend the scaffold for you it would be merely the arena in which like many others you would make a disgusting display of hardened ferocity or dying as you have lived exhale your last sigh with an impious scoff or profane blasphemy that must not be permitted it is a bad example to set before a gazing crowd the spectacle of a condemned being making sport of the instrument of death swaggering before the executioner and yielding with an obscene jest the divine spark infused into man by the breath of a creating god to punish the body is easily done to save the soul is the great thing to be laboured for and desired all sin may be forgiven said our blessed saviour but from the tribunal to the scaffold the passage is too short time and opportunity are required to repent and make atonement this leisure you shall have may god grant that you turn it to the right purpose the schoolmaster remained utterly bewildered for the first time in his life a vague and confused dread of something more horrible far than death itself crossed his guilty mind he trembled before the suggestions of his own imagination rodolph went on anselme duresnel i will not sentence you to the galleys neither shall you die then do you intend sending me to hell or what are you going to do with me listen said rodolph rising from his seat with an air of menacing authority you have wickedly abused the great bodily strength bestowed upon you i will paralyze that strength the strongest have trembled before you 
i will make you henceforward shrink in the presence of the weakest of beings assassin murderer you have plunged god's creatures into eternal night your darkness shall commence even in this life now this very hour your punishment shall be proportioned to your crimes but added rodolph with an accent of mournful pity the terrible judgment i am about to pronounce will at least leave the future open to your efforts for pardon and for peace i should be guilty as you are were i in punishing you to seek only for vengeance just as is my right to demand it far from being unrelenting as death your sentence shall bring forth good fruits for hereafter far from destroying your soul it shall help you seek its salvation if to prevent you from further violating the commandments of your maker i for ever deprive you of the beauties of this outer world if i plunge you into impenetrable darkness with no other companion than the remembrance of your crimes it is that you may incessantly contemplate their enormity yes separated for ever from this external world your thoughts must needs revert to yourself and your vision dwell internally upon the bygone scenes of your ill-spent life and i am not without hope that such a mental and constantly presented picture will send the blush of shame even upon your hardened features that your soul deadened as it now is to every good and holy impulse will become softened and tender by repentance your language too will be changed and good and prayerful words take place of those daring and blasphemous expressions which now disgrace your lips you are brutal and overbearing because you are strong you will become mild and gentle when you are deprived of that strength now your heart scoffs at the very mention of repentance but the day will come when bowed to the earth with deep contrition you will bewail your victims in dust and ashes you have degraded the intelligence placed within you by a supreme power you have reduced it to the brutal instincts of rapine and murder from a man formed after the image of his creator you have made yourself a beast of prey one day as i trust and believe that intelligence will be purified by remorse and rendered again guiltless through divine expiation you more inhuman than the beast which perisheth have trampled on the tender feelings by which even animals are actuated you have been the destroyer of your partner and your offspring after a long life entirely devoted to the expiation of your crimes you may venture to implore of the almighty the great though unmerited happiness of obtaining the pardon of your wife and son and dying in their presence as rodolph uttered these last words his voice trembled with emotion and he was obliged to conclude the schoolmaster's terrors had during this long discourse entirely yielded to an opinion that he was only to be subjected to a long lecture on morality and so forth and then discharged upon his own promise of amendment for the many mysterious words uttered by rodolph he looked upon as mere vague expressions intended to alarm him nothing more still further reassured by the mild tone in which rodolph had addressed him the ruffian assumed his usually insolent air and manner as he said bursting into a loud and vulgar laugh well done upon my word a very good sermon and very well spoken only we must recollect where we leave off in our moral catechism that we may begin all right next lesson day come let us have something lively now what do you say master would you guess a charade or two just to enliven us a bit instead of replying rodolph addressed the black doctor proceed david and if i do wrong may the almighty punish me alone the negro rang two men entered david pointed to a side door which opened into an adjoining closet the chair in which the schoolmaster remained bound so as to be incapable of the smallest movement was then rolled into the ante-room are you going to murder me then mercy mercy shrieked the wretched man as he was being removed gag him cried the negro entering the closet rodolph and the chourineur were left alone monsieur rodolph said the chourineur pale and trembling monsieur rodolph what is going to be done i never felt so frightened pray speak i must be dreaming surely what have they done to the schoolmaster he does not cry out all is so silent 
it makes me more fearful still at this moment david issued from the cabinet his complexion had that livid hue peculiar to the negro countenance while his lips were ashy pale the men who had conveyed the schoolmaster into the closet now replaced him still bound in his chair on the spot he had previously occupied in rodolph's presence unbind him and remove the gag exclaimed david there was a moment of fearful silence while the two attendants relieved the schoolmaster of his gag and untied the cords which bound him to the chair as the last ligature gave way he sprang up his hideous countenance expressing rage horror and alarm he advanced one step with extended hands then falling back into the chair he uttered a cry of unspeakable agony and raising his hands towards the ceiling exclaimed with maddened fury blind by heaven give him this pocket-book david said rodolph the negro placed a small pocket-book in the trembling hands of the schoolmaster you will find in that pocket-book wherewithal to provide yourself with a home and the means of living for the remainder of your days go seek out some safe and solitary dwelling where by humble repentance you may seek to propitiate an offended god you are free go and repent the lord is merciful and his ears are ever open to such as truly repent blind quite blind repeated the schoolmaster mechanically grasping the pocket-book open the doors let him depart said rodolph blind blind repeated the bewildered and discomfited ruffian you are free you have the means of providing for yourself be gone and whither am i to go exclaimed he with the most unbounded rage you have taken away my sight how then do i know in which direction to go call you not this a crime thus to abuse your power over one unhappily in your hands thus to to abuse my power repeated rodolph in a solemn voice and how have you employed the power granted to you how used your superior strength oh death how gladly would i now accept you cried the wretched man to be henceforward at every one's mercy to fear the weakest the smallest object a child might now master me gracious god what will become of me you have plenty of money it will be taken from me cried the ruffian mark those words it will be taken from me see how they fill you with fear and dread you have plundered so many unmindful of their helpless destitute condition be gone for the love of god cried the schoolmaster in a suppliant tone let some person lead me forth what will become of me in the streets oh in mercy kill me take my miserable life but do not turn me out thus wretched thus helpless kill for pity's sake and save me from being crushed beneath the first vehicle i encounter no live and repent repent shouted the schoolmaster in a fearful voice never i will live for vengeance for deep and fearful vengeance and again he threw himself from the chair holding his clenched fists in a menacing attitude towards the ceiling as though calling upon heaven to witness the fixedness of his resolve in an instant his step faltered he again hesitated as though fearful of a thousand dangers alas alas i cannot proceed i dare not move and i lately so strong and so dreaded by all look at me now yet no one pities me no one cares for me no hand is stretched out to help the wretched blind upon his lonely way it is impossible to express the stupefaction and alarm expressed by the countenance of the chourineur during this terrible scene his rough features exhibited the deepest compassion for his fallen foe and approaching rodolph he said in a low tone monsieur rodolph he was an accomplished villain and has only got what he richly deserves he wanted to murder me a little while ago too but he is now blind he does not even know how to find his way out of the house and he may be crushed to death in the streets may i lead him to some safe place where at least he may remain quiet for a time nobly said replied rodolph 
kindly pressing the hand of the chourineur go my worthy fellow go with him by all means the chourineur approached the schoolmaster and laid his hand on his shoulder the miserable villain started who touches me asked he in a husky voice it is i i who who are you friend or foe the chourineur and you have come to avenge yourself now you find i am incapable of protecting myself i suppose nothing of the sort here take my arm you cannot find the way out by yourself let me lead you there you chourineur you yes for all you doubt it but you vex me by not seeming to like my help come hold tight by me i will see you all right before i leave you are you quite sure you do not mean me some harm that you are only laying a trap to ensnare me i am not such a scoundrel as to take advantage of your misfortune but let us be gone come on old fellow it will be daylight directly day which i shall never more behold day and night to me are henceforward all the same exclaimed the schoolmaster in such piteous tones that rodolph unable longer to endure this scene abruptly retired followed by david who first dismissed his two assistants the chourineur and the schoolmaster remained alone after a lengthened silence the latter spoke first by inquiring whether it were really true that the pocket-book presented to him contained money yes i can positively speak to its containing five thousand francs replied the chourineur since i put them in it with my own hand with that sum you could easily place yourself to board with some quiet good sort of people who would look to you in some retired spot in the country where you might pass your days happily or would you like me to take you to the ogresses she she would not leave me a rap well then will you go to bras rouge no no he would poison me first and rob me afterwards well then where shall i take you i know not happily for both you are no thief chourineur here take my pocket-book and conceal it carefully in my waistcoat that la chouette may not see it she would plunder me of every sou oh bless you the chouette is quite safe just now she lies in the hôpital beaujon while i was struggling with you both to-night i happened to dislocate her leg so she's obliged to lie up for the present but what in heaven's name shall i do with this black curtain continually before my eyes in vain i try to push it away it is still there fixed immovable and on its surface i see the pale ghastly features of those he shuddered and said in a low hoarse voice chourineur did i quite do for that man last night no so much the better observed the robber and then after some minutes silence he exclaimed under a fresh impulse of ungovernable fury and it is you i have to thank for all this rascal scoundrel i hate you but for you i should have stiffened my man and walked off with his money my very blindness i owe to you my curse is upon you for your meddling interference but through you i should have had my blessed eyes to see my own way with how do i know what devil's trick you are planning at this moment try to forget all that is past it can't be helped now and do not put yourself in such a terrible way it is really very bad for you come come along now no nonsense will you yes or no because i am regularly done up and must get a short snooze somewhere i can tell you i have had a belly full of such doings and to-morrow i shall get back to my timber pile and earn an honest dinner before i eat it i am only waiting to take you wherever you decide upon going and then on goes my nightcap and i goes to sleep but how can i tell you where to take me when i do not know myself my lodging no no that will not do i should be obliged to tell well then hark ye will you for a day or two make shift with my crib i may meet with some decent sort of people who not knowing who you really are would receive you as a boarder and we might say you were a confirmed invalid and require great care and perfect retirement now i think of it there is a person of my acquaintance living at port st nicolas has a mother a very worthy woman but in humble circumstances residing at st mandé 
very likely she would be glad to take charge of you what do you say will you come or not one may trust you chourineur i am not at all fearful of going money and all to your place happily you have kept yourself honest amidst all the evil example others have set you ay and even bore the taunts and jests you used to heap upon me because i would not turn prig like yourself alas who could foresee now you see if i had listened to you instead of trying to be of real service to you i should clean you out of all your cash true true but you are a downright good fellow and have neither malice nor hatred in your heart said the unhappy schoolmaster in a tone of deep dejection and humility you are a vast deal better to me than i fear i should have been to you under the same circumstances i believe you too why m rodolph himself told me i had both heart and honour but who the devil is this m rodolph exclaimed the schoolmaster breaking out fresh at the mention of his name he is not a man he is a monster a fiend a eh? hold hold cried the chourineur now you are going to have another fit which is bad for you and very disagreeable to me because it makes you abuse my friends come are you ready shall we set forth on our journey we are going to your lodging are we not chourineur yes yes if you are agreeable and you swear to me that you bear me no ill will for the events of the last twelve hours swear it of course i swear it why i have no ill will against you nor anybody and you are certain that he the man i mean is not dead i am as sure of it as that i am living myself that will at least give me one crime the less to answer for if they only knew and that little old man of the rue du roule and that woman of the canal saint martin but it is useless thinking of all those things now i have enough to occupy my thoughts without trying to recall past misfortunes blind blind repeated the miserable wretch as leaning on the arm of the chourineur he slowly took his departure from the house in the allée des veuves End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugene Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen The Ile Adam. A month has elapsed since the occurrence of the events we have just narrated. We now conduct the reader into the little town of the Ile Adam, situated in a delightful locality on the banks of the Oise and at the foot of a forest. The least things become great events in the country and so the idlers of Iladon, who were on the morning before us walking in the square before the church were very anxiously bestirring themselves to learn when the individual would arrive who had recently become the purchaser of the most eligible premises for a butcher in that town and which were exactly opposite to the church one of those idlers more inquisitive than his companions went and asked the butcher-boy who with a merry face and active hands was very busy in completing the arrangements of the shop this lad replied that he did not know who was the new proprietor for he had bought the property through an agent at this moment two persons who had come from paris in a cabriolet alighted at the door of the shop the one was murphy quite cured of his wound and the other the chourineur at the risk of repeating a vulgar saying we will assert that the impression produced by dress is so powerful that the guest of the cribs of the cite was hardly to be recognized in his present attire his countenance had undergone the same change he had put off with his rags his savage coarse and vulgar air and to see him walk with both his hands in the pockets of his long and warm coat of dark broadcloth he might have been taken for one of the most inoffensive citizens in the world faith my fine fellow the way was long and the cold excessive were they not why i really did not perceive it monsieur murphy i am too happy and joy keeps one warm besides when i say happy why what yesterday you came to seek for me at the pas saint nicolas where i was unloading as hard as i could to keep myself warm i had not seen you since the night when the white-haired negro had put out the schoolmaster's eyes by jove it quite shook me that affair did and monsieur rodolph what a countenance 
he who looked so mild and gentle i was quite frightened at that moment i was indeed well what then you said to me good day chourineur good day monsieur murphy says i what you are up again i see so much the better so much the better and monsieur rodolph he was obliged to leave paris some days after the affair at the allee des veuves and he forgot you my man well monsieur murphy i can only say that if monsieur rodolph has forgotten me why i shall be very sorry for it that's all i meant to say my good fellow that he had forgotten to recompense your services but that he should always remember them so monsieur murphy those words cheered me up again directly tonnerre i i shall never forget him he told me i had heart and honour that's enough unfortunately my lad monseigneur left without giving any orders about you i have nothing but what monseigneur gives me and i am unable to repay as i could wish all that i owe you personally come come monsieur murphy you are jesting with me but why the devil did you not come back to the allee des veuves after that fatal night then monseigneur would not have left without thinking of you why monsieur rodolph did not tell me to do so and i thought that perhaps he had no further occasion for me but you might have supposed that he would at least desire to express his gratitude to you did you not tell me that monsieur rodolph has not forgotten me monsieur murphy well well don't let us say another word about it only i have had a great deal of trouble to find you out you do not now go to the ogresses no why not oh from some foolish notions i have had very well but to return to what you were telling me to what monsieur murphy you told me i am glad i have found you and still happy perhaps oh yes monsieur murphy why you see when you came to where i was at work at the timber yard you said my lad i am not rich but i can procure you a situation where your work will be easier than on the quay and where you will gain four francs a day four francs a day vive la charte i could not believe it twas the pay of an adjutant sub-officer i replied that's the very thing for me monsieur murphy but you said then that i must not look so like a beggar as that would frighten the employer to whom you would take me i answered i have not the means of dressing otherwise you said to me come to the temple i followed you i chose the most spicy attire that mother hubbard had you advanced me the money to pay her and in a quarter of an hour i was as smart as a landlord or a dentist you appointed me to meet you this morning at the porte st denis at daybreak i found you there in a cab and here we are well do you find anything to regret in all this why i'll tell you monsieur murphy you see to be dressed in this way spoils a fellow and so you see when i put on again my old smock frock and trousers i shan't like it and then to gain four francs a day i who never earned but two and that all at once why i seem to have made too great a start all of a sudden and that it cannot last i would rather sleep all my life on the wretched straw bed in my cock loft then sleep five or six nights only in a good bed that's my view of the thing and you are by no means peculiar in your view but the best thing is to sleep always in a good bed and no mistake it is better to have a belly full of victuals every day than to starve with hunger ah here is a butchery here said the chourineur as he listened to the blows of the chopper which the boy was using and observed the quarters of beef through the curtains yes my lad it belongs to a friend of mine would you like to see it whilst the horse just recovers his wind i really should for it reminds me of my boyish days if it was only when i had montfauçon for a slaughter-house and broken-down horses for cattle it is droll but if i had the means a butcher's is the trade in which i should set up for i like it to go on a good nag to buy cattle at fairs to return home to one's own fireside to warm yourself if cold or dry yourself if wet to find your housekeeper or a good jolly plump wife cheerful and pleasant with a parcel of children to feel in your pockets to see if you have brought them home anything and then in the morning in the slaughter-house to seize an ox by the horns 
particularly when he's fierce no done no he must be fierce then to put on the ring cleave him down cut him up dress him tonnerre that would have been my ambition as it was the goualeuse's to suck barley sugar when she was a little un by the way that poor girl monsieur murphy not seeing her any more at the ogress's i suppose that monsieur rodolph had taken her away from there that's a good action monsieur murphy poor child she never liked to do wrong she was so young and then the habit ah monsieur rodolph has behaved quite right i am of your opinion but will you come into the shop until our horse has rested a while the chourineur and murphy entered the shop and then went to see the yard where three splendid oxen and a score of sheep were fastened up they then visited the stable the chaise house the slaughter house the lofts and the outbuildings of the house which were all in excellent order and kept with a cleanliness and care which bespoke regularity and easy circumstances when they had seen all but the upstairs murphy said you must own that my friend is a lucky fellow this house and property are his without counting a thousand crowns in hand to carry on his business with and he is besides only thirty-eight strong as a bull with an iron constitution and very fond of his business the industrious and civil journeyman that you saw in the shop supplies his place with much capability when he goes to the fairs to purchase cattle i say again is he not a lucky fellow he is indeed monsieur murphy but you see there are lucky and unlucky people and when i think that i am going to gain four francs a day and know how many there are who only earn the half or even less will you come up and see the rest of the house with all my heart monsieur murphy the person who is about to employ you is upstairs the person who is going to employ me yes why then didn't you tell me that before i'll tell you one moment said the chourineur with a downcast and embarrassed air taking murphy by the arm listen whilst i say a word to you which perhaps m rodolph did not tell you but which i ought not to conceal from the master who employs me because if he is offended by it why then you see why afterwards what do you mean to say i mean to say well what that i am a convict who has served his time that i have been at the bang said chourineur in a low voice indeed replied murphy but i never did wrong to any one exclaimed the chourineur and i would sooner die of hunger than rob but i have done worse than rob he added bending his head down i have killed my fellow-creature in a passion but that is not all he continued after a moment's pause i will tell everything to my employer i would rather be refused at first than detected afterwards you know him and if you think he would refuse me why spare me the refusal and i will go as i came come along with me said murphy the chourineur followed murphy up the staircase a door opened and they were both in the presence of rodolph my good murphy said he leave us together a while End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen recompense vive la charte cried the chourineur how precious glad i am to see you again monsieur rodolph or rather my lord good day my excellent friend i am equally glad to see you oh what a joker monsieur murphy is he told me you had gone away but stay my lord call me monsieur rodolph i like that best well then monsieur rodolph i have to ask your pardon for not having been to see you after the night with the schoolmaster i see now that i was guilty of a great rudeness but i do not suppose that you had any desire to see me i forgive you said rodolph smiling and then added murphy has shown you all over the house yes monsieur rodolph and a fine house and fine shop it is all so neat and so comfortable talking of comfortable i am the man that will be so monsieur rodolph 
monsieur murphy is going to put me in the way of earning four francs a day yes four francs a day i have something better than that to propose to you my good fellow better it's impolite to contradict you but i think that would be difficult four francs a day i tell you i have something better for this house all that it contains the shop and a thousand crowns which are in this pocket-book are all yours the chourineur smiled with a stupid air flattened his long napped hat between his knees and squeezed it convulsively evidently not understanding what rodolph said to him although his language was plain enough rodolph with much kindness said to him i can imagine your surprise but i again repeat this house and this money are yours they are your property the chourineur became purple passed his horny hand over his brow which was bathed with perspiration and stammered out in a faltering voice what a eh, that is indeed my property yes your property for i bestow it all upon you do you understand i give it to you the chourineur rocked backwards and forwards on his chair scratched his head coughed looked down on the ground and made no reply he felt that the thread of his ideas had escaped him he heard quite well what rodolph said to him and that was the very reason he could not credit what he heard between the depth of misery the degradation in which he had always existed and the position in which rodolph now placed him there was an abyss so wide that the service he had rendered to rodolph important as it was could not fill it up does what i give you then seem beyond your hopes inquired rodolph my lord said the chourineur starting up suddenly you offer me this house and a great deal of money to tempt me but i cannot take them i never robbed in my life it is perhaps to kill but i have too often dreamed of the sergeant added he in a hoarse tone oh the unfortunate exclaimed rodolph with bitterness the compassion evinced for them is so rare that they can only explain liberality as a temptation to crime then addressing the chourineur in a voice full of gentleness you judge me wrong you mistake i shall require from you nothing but what is honourable what i give you i give because you have deserved it i said the chourineur whose embarrassments recommenced i deserve it how i will tell you abandoned from your infancy without any knowledge of right or wrong left to your natural instinct shut up for fifteen years in the bang with the most desperate villains assailed by want and wretchedness compelled by your own disgrace and the opinion of honest men to continue to haunt the low dens infested by the vilest malefactors you have not only remained honest but remorse for your crime has outlived the expiation which human justice had inflicted upon you this simple and noble language was a new source of astonishment for the chourineur he contemplated rodolph with respect mingled with fear and gratitude but was still unable to convince himself that all he heard was reality what monsieur rodolph because you beat me because thinking you a workman like myself because you spoke slang as if you had learned it from the cradle i told you my history over two bottles of wine and afterwards i saved you from being drowned you give me a house money i shall be master say really monsieur rodolph once more is it possible believing me like yourself you told me your history naturally and without concealment without withholding either what was culpable or generous i have judged you and judged you well and i have resolved to recompense you but monsieur rodolph it ought not to be there are poor labourers who have been honest all their lives and who i know it and it may be i have done for many others more than i am doing for you but if the man who lives honestly in the midst of honest men encouraged by their esteem deserves assistance and support he who in spite of the aversion of good men remains honest amidst the most infamous associates on earth he too deserves assistance and support this is not all you saved my life you saved the life of murphy the dearest friend i have and what i do for you is as much the dictate of personal gratitude as it is the desire to withdraw from pollution a good and generous nature which has been perverted but not destroyed and that is not all what else have i done monsieur rodolph 
rodolph took his hand and shaking it heartily said filled with commiseration for the mischief which had befallen the very man who had tried just before to kill you you even gave him asylum in your humble dwelling number nine close to notre dame you knew then where i lived monsieur rodolph if you forget the services you have done to me i do not when you left my house you were followed and were seen to enter there with the schoolmaster but m murphy told me that you did not know where i lived m rodolph i was desirous of trying you still further i wished to know if you had disinterestedness in your generosity and i found that after your courageous conduct you returned to your hard daily labour asking nothing hoping for nothing not even uttering a word of reproach for the apparent ingratitude with which i repaid your services and when murphy yesterday proposed to you employment a little more profitable than that of your habitual toil you accepted it with joy with gratitude why monsieur rodolph do you see sir four francs a day are always four francs a day as to the service i rendered you why it is rather i who ought to thank you how so yes yes monsieur rodolph he added with a saddened air i do not forget that since i knew you it was you who said to me those two words you have both heart and honour it is astonishing how i have thought of that there are only two little words and yet those two words had that effect but in truth so two small grains of anything in the soil and they will put forth shoots this comparison just and almost poetical as it was struck rodolph in sooth two words but two magic words for the heart that understood them had almost suddenly developed the generous instincts which were inherent in this energetic nature you place the schoolmaster at st mandé said rodolph yes monsieur rodolph he made me change his notes for gold and buy a belt which i sewed round his body and in which i put his mopuses and then good day he boards for thirty sous a day with good people to whom that sum is of much service when i have time to leave my wood-piles i shall go and see how he gets on your wood-piles you forget your shop and that you are here at home come monsieur rodolph do not amuse yourself by jesting with a poor devil like me you have had your fun in proving me as you term it my house and my shop are songs to the same tune you said to yourself let us see if this chourineur is such a gulpin as to believe that i will make him such a present enough enough monsieur rodolph you are a wag and there's an end of the matter and he laughed long loud and heartily but once more believe if i were to believe you then you would say poor chourineur go you are a trouble to me now rodolph began to be really troubled how to convince the chourineur and said in a solemn impressive and almost severe tone i never make sport of the gratitude and sympathy with which noble conduct inspires me i have said this house and this establishment are yours if they suit you for the bargain is conditional i swear to you on my honour all this belongs to you and i make you a present of it for the reasons i have already given the dignified and firm tone and the serious expression of the features of rodolph at length convinced the chourineur for some moments he looked at his protector in silence and then said in a voice of deep emotion i believe you my lord and i thank you much a poor man like me cannot make fine speeches but once more indeed on my word i thank you very much all i can say is that i will never refuse assistance to the unhappy because hunger and misery are ogresses of the same sort as those who laid hands on the poor goualeuse and once in that sink it is not every one that has the fist strong enough to pull you out again my worthy fellow you cannot prove your gratitude more than in speaking to me thus so much the better my lord or else i should have a hard job to prove it come now let us visit your house my good old murphy has had the pleasure and i should like it also rodolph and the chourineur came downstairs at the moment they reached the yard the shopman addressing the chourineur said to him respectfully since you sir are to be my master i beg to tell you that our custom is capital we have no more cutlets or legs of mutton left 
and we must kill a sheep or two directly parbleu said rodolph to the chourineur here is a capital opportunity for exercising your skill i should like to have the first sample the open air has given me an appetite and i will taste your cutlets you are very kind monsieur rodolph said the chourineur in a cheerful voice you flatter me but i will do my best shall i bring two sheep to the slaughter-house master asked the journeyman yes and bring a well-sharpened knife not too thin in the blade and strong in the back i have just what you want master there you should shave with it take it tonnerre monsieur rodolph said the chourineur taking off his upper coat with haste and turning up his shirt-sleeves which displayed a pair of arms like a prize-fighter's this reminds me of my boyish days and the slaughter-house you shall see how i handle a knife no de no i wish i was at it the knife lad the knife that's it i see you know your trade this is a blade who will have it tonnerre with a tool like this i could face a wild bull and the chourineur brandished his knife his eyes began to fill with blood the beast was regaining the mastery the instinct and thirst for blood reappeared in all the fullness of their fearful predominance the butchery was in the yard a vaulted dark place paved with stones and lighted by a small narrow opening at the top the man drove one of the sheep to the door shall i fasten him to the ring master fasten him tonnerre and i with knees at liberty oh no i will hold him here as fast as if in a vice give me the beast and go back to the shop the journeyman obeyed rodolph was left alone with the chourineur and watched him attentively almost anxiously now then to work said he oh i shan't be long tonnerre you shall see how i handle a knife my hands burn and i have a singing in my ears my temples beat as they used when i was going to see red come here thou oh madelon let me stab you dead then his eyes sparkled with a fierce delight and no longer conscious of the presence of rodolph the chourineur lifted the sheep without an effort with one spring he carried it off as a wolf would do bounding towards his lair with his prey rodolph followed him and leaned on one of the wings of the door which he closed the butchery was dark one strong ray of light falling straight down lighted up a la rembrandt the rugged features of the chourineur his light hair and his red whiskers stooping low holding in his teeth a long knife which glittered in the darkness visible he drew the sheep between his legs and when he had adjusted it took it by the head stretched out its neck and cut its throat at the instant when the sheep felt the keen blade it gave one gentle low and pitiful bleat and raising its dying eyes to the chourineur two spurts of blood jetted forth into the face of its slayer the cry the look the blood that spouted out made a fearful impression on the man his knife fell from his hands his features grew livid contracted and horrible beneath the blood that covered them his eyes expanded his hair stiffened and then retreating with a gesture of horror he cried in a suffocating voice oh the sergeant the sergeant rodolph hastened to him recover yourself my good fellow there there the sergeant repeated the chourineur retreating step by step with his eyes fixed and haggard and pointing with his finger as if at some invisible phantom then uttering a fearful cry as if the spectre had touched him he rushed to the bottom of the butchery into the darkest corner and there with his face breast and arms against the wall as if he would break through it to escape from so horrible a vision he repeated in a hollow and convulsive tone oh the sergeant the sergeant the sergeant End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the mysteries of paris volume one by jeanne sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty the departure thanks to the care of murphy and rodolph who with difficulty calmed his agitation the chourineur was completely restored to himself and was alone with the prince in one of the rooms on the first floor in the house my lord 
said he despondingly you have been very kind indeed to me but hear me i would rather be a thousand times more wretched than i have yet been than become a butcher yet reflect a little why my lord when i heard the cry of the poor animal which could not make the slightest resistance when i felt its blood spring into my face hot blood which seemed as coming from a living thing you cannot imagine what i felt then i had my dream all over again the sergeant and those poor young fellows whom i cut and stabbed who made no defence and died giving me a look so gentle so gentle that they seemed as if they pitied me my lord it would drive me mad and the poor fellow hid his face in his hands with a convulsive start come come calm yourself excuse me my lord but just now the sight of blood of a knife i could not bear at every instant it would renew those dreams which i was beginning to forget to have every day my hands and feet in blood to cut the throats of poor animals who do not so much as make a struggle oh no no i could not for the world i would rather lose my eyesight at once like the schoolmaster than be compelled to follow such a business it is impossible to depict the energetic gesture action and countenance of the chourineur as he thus expressed himself rodolph was deeply affected by it and satisfied with the horrible effect which the sight of the blood had caused to his protege for a moment the savage feeling the bloodthirsty instinct had overcome the human being in the chourineur but remorse eventually overwhelmed the instinct that was as it should be and it was a fine lesson forgive me my lord said the chourineur in a faltering voice i make but a bad recompense for all your kindness to me but not at all my good fellow i told you that our bargain was conditional i selected for you the business of a butcher because your inclinations and tastes seem to lie in that direction alas my lord that's true and had it not been for what you know of that would have been the trade of all others i should have chosen i was only saying to monsieur murphy a little while since as it was just possible that your taste did not lie that way i have thought of another arrangement for you a person who has a large tract of property at algiers will give me up for you one of the extensive farms he holds in that country the lands belonging to it are very fertile and in full bearing but i will not conceal from you this estate is situated on the boundaries of the atlas mountains that is near the outposts and exposed to the frequent attacks of the arabs and one must be as much of a soldier as a husbandman it is at the same time a redoubt and a farm the man who occupies this dwelling in the absence of the proprietor will explain everything to you they say he is honest and faithful and you may retain him there as long as you like once established there you will not only increase your means by your labour and ability but render a real service to your country by your courage the colonists have formed a militia and the extent of your property the number of your tenants who will depend on you will make you the chief of a very considerable troop headed by your courage this band may be extremely useful in protecting the properties which are throughout the plain i repeat to you that this prospect for you would please me very much in spite of or rather in consequence of the danger because you could at the same time display your natural intrepidity and because having thus expiated and as i may say ransomed yourself from a great crime your restitution to society would be more noble more complete more heroic if it were worked out in the midst of perils in an unconquered clime than in the midst of the quiet inhabitants of a little town if i did not first offer you this it was because it was probable that the other would suit you and the latter is so hazardous that i would not expose you to it without giving you the choice there is still time and if this proposition for algiers does not suit you tell me so frankly and we will look out for something else if not to-morrow everything shall be signed and you will start for algiers with a person commissioned by the former proprietor of the farm to put you in full possession two years rent will be due and paid to you on your arrival the land yields three thousand francs a year work improve it be active vigilant and you will soon increase your comfort and the security of the colonists whom you will aid and assist i am sure for you will always be charitable and generous and remember too to be rich implies that we should give much away although separated from you i shall not lose sight of you and never forget that i and my best friend owe our lives to you 
the only proof of attachment and gratitude i ask is to learn to write and read as quickly as you can that you may inform me regularly once a week what you do and to address yourself to me direct if you need any advice or assistance it is useless to describe the extreme delight of the chourineur his disposition his instincts are already sufficiently known to the reader so that he may understand that no proposal could have been made more acceptable to him next day all was arranged and the chourineur set out for algiers End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one researches the house which rodolph had in the allee des veuves was not his usual place of residence he lived in one of the largest mansions in the faubourg st germain situated at the end of the rue plumet and the boulevard des invalides to avoid the honours due to his sovereign rank the prince had preserved his incognito since his arrival in paris his chargé d'affaires at the court of france having announced that his master would pay his official and indispensable visits under the name and title of the count de duren thanks to this usage a very common one in the northern courts a prince may travel with as much liberty as pleasure and escape all the bore of ceremonious introductions in spite of his slight incognito rodolph kept up in his mansion full state and etiquette we will introduce the reader into the hotel of the rue Plumet the day after the chourineur had started for algiers the clock had just struck ten a m in the middle of a large salon on the ground floor and which formed the antechamber to rodolph's business chamber murphy was seated before a bureau and sealing several despatches a groom of the chambers dressed in black and wearing a silver chain around his neck opened the folding doors and announced his excellency monsieur le baron de graun murphy without ceasing from his employment received the baron with a nod at once cordial and familiar monsieur le chargé d'affaires said he smiling will you warm yourself at the fire i will be at your service in one moment monsieur the private secretary i await your leisure replied monsieur de graun gaily and making with mock respect a low and respectful bow to the worthy squire the baron was about fifty years of age with hair grey thin and lightly curled and powdered his chin rather projecting was partly concealed in a high cravat of white muslin starched very stiffly and of unimpeachable whiteness his countenance was expressive of great intelligence and his carriage was distingue whilst beneath his gold spectacles there beamed an eye as shrewd as it was penetrating although it was only ten o'clock in the morning m de graun wore a black coat that was etiquette and a ribbon shot with several bright colours was suspended from his buttonhole he placed his hat on a chair and took his station near the fireplace whilst murphy continued his work his royal highness no doubt was of the best part of the night my dear murphy for your correspondence appears considerable monseigneur went to bed at six o'clock this morning he wrote amongst other letters one of eight pages to the grand marshal and dictated to me one equally long to the chief of the upper council the prince herkhausen aldunzal his royal highness's cousin you know that his son prince henry has entered as lieutenant in the guards of the service of his majesty and the emperor of austria yes monseigneur recommended him most warmly as his relation and he really is a fine excellent young man handsome as an angel and as good as gold the fact is my dear murphy that if the young prince had had his entree to the grand ducal abbey of st hermengild of which his aunt is the superior the poor nuns baron baron why my dear sir the heir of paris but let us talk seriously shall i await the rising of his royal highness to communicate all the particulars which i have procured no my dear baron monseigneur has desired that he should not be called before two or three o'clock in the afternoon he desires also that you send off this morning these despatches by a special courier instead of waiting till monday you will entrust me with all the particulars you have acquired and i will communicate them to monseigneur when he wakes these are his orders nothing can be better and i think his royal highness will be satisfied with what i have collected but my dear murphy i hope the despatch of the special courier is not a bad sign the last despatches which i had the honour of sending to his royal highness announced that all was going on well at home and it is precisely because my lord is desirous of expressing as early as possible his entire satisfaction 
that he wishes a courier to be despatched this very day to prince herrkausen aldenzal chief of the supreme council that is so like his royal highness were it to blame instead of commend he would observe less haste nothing new has transpired with us my dear baron nothing at all our mysterious adventures are wholly unknown you know that since the arrival of his royal highness in paris his friends have become used to see him but little in public it is understood that he prefers seclusion and is in the habit of making frequent excursions to the environs of paris and with the exception of the countess sarah macgregor and her brother no person is aware of the disguises assumed by his royal highness and neither of the personages i have mentioned have the smallest interest in betraying the secret ah my dear baron exclaimed murphy heaving a deep sigh what an unfortunate thing it is that this accursed countess should be left a widow at this very important moment she was married i think in eighteen twenty seven or eighteen twenty eight in eighteen twenty seven shortly after the death of the unfortunate child who would now be in her sixteenth or seventeenth year and whose loss his royal highness seems daily more to deplore far more so indeed than he appears to feel for the loss of his legitimate offspring and thus my dear baron we may account for the deep interest his royal highness takes in the poor goualeuse arising as it does from the fact that the daughter so deeply deplored would had she lived have been precisely the same age as this unfortunate young creature it is indeed an unfortunate affair that the countess sarah from whom we fancied we were for ever freed should have become a widow exactly eighteen months after his royal highness had been deprived by death of the wife with whom he had passed years of wedded happiness the countess i am persuaded looks upon this double freedom from all marriage vows as a signal intervention of providence to further her views and her impetuous passion has become more ardent than ever though she is well aware that my lord feels for her the deepest aversion and well-merited contempt was not her culpable indifference the cause of her child's death did she not cause ah baron said murphy leaving the sentence unfinished this woman is our evil genius god grant she may not reappear amongst us laden with fresh misfortunes but still under present circumstances any views countess sarah may entertain must be absurd in the greatest degree the death of the unfortunate child you just now alluded to has broken the last tie which might have attached my lord to this dangerous woman she must be mad as well as foolish to persist in so hopeless a pursuit if she be mad there is a dangerous method in her madness her brother you are aware partakes of her ambitious schemes and obstinate opinions of ultimate success although this worthy pair have as much reason for utter despair as they had eighteen years since of entire success eighteen years what an accumulation of evil has been wrought during that period by the criminal compliance of that rascally polidori by the way talking of that miserable wretch i have traced that he was here about a year or two ago suffering no doubt from the most perfect destitution or else subsisting by disgraceful and dishonourable practices what a pity that a man so largely endowed with penetration talent deep learning and natural intelligence should sink so low the innate perversity of his character marred all these high qualities it is to be hoped he and the countess will not meet the junction of two such evil spirits is indeed to be feared for what frightful consequences might there not result from it now touching the facts you have been collecting have you them about you here said the baron drawing a paper from his pocket are the various particulars i have been enabled to collect touching the birth of a young girl known as la goualeuse and also of the now residence of an individual called francois germain son of the schoolmaster be kind enough to read me the result of your inquiries my dear de Graun. i am well aware what are his royal highness's intentions in the matter i shall be able to judge then whether the information you possess will be sufficient to enable him to carry them into effect you have every reason to be satisfied with the agent you employ i suppose oh he is a rare fellow so precise methodical zealous and intelligent i am indeed sometimes obliged to moderate his energy for i am well aware there are certain points the clearing up of which his highness reserves for himself and of course your agent is far from suspecting the deep interest his royal highness has in the matter entirely so 
my diplomatic position affords an excellent pretext for the inquiries i have undertaken m badinot for such is the name of the person i am speaking of is a sharp shrewd individual having connections either recognized or concealed in every grade of society he was formerly a lawyer but compelled to quit his profession from some very serious breach of trust he has however retained very accurate recollections touching the fortunes and situations of his old clients he knows many a secret which he boasts with considerable effrontery of having turned to a good account by turns rich and poor now successful and then a ruined man he only ceased his speculations when none could be found to take part in them with him reduced to live from day to day by expedients more or less illegal he became a curious specimen of the figaro school so long as his interest was concerned he would devote himself soul and body to his employer and we are sure of his fidelity for the simple reason that he has nothing to gain though a great deal to lose by deceiving us and besides i make him careful of our interests even unknown to himself the particulars he has hitherto furnished us with have been very correct and satisfactory oh he has a very straightforward manner of going to work and i assure you my dear murphy that m badinot is the very original type of one of those mysterious existences which are to be met with and only possible in paris he would greatly amuse his royal highness if it were not necessary to avoid their being known to each other in this business you can augment the pay of m badinot if you deem it necessary why really five hundred francs a month and his expenses amounting to nearly the same sum appear to me quite sufficient we shall see by and by and he does not seem ashamed of the part he plays on the contrary he is not a little vain of his employment and when he brings me any particulars assumes a certain air of importance he would fain pass off as due to his diplomatic functions for the fellow either thinks or feigns to do so that he is deeply engaged in state affairs and ventures to observe at times in a sort of undertone how very marvellous it is that such close and intimate relationship should be found to exist between everyday events and the destinies of kingdoms yes really he had the impudence to remark to me the other day what complicated machinery is contained in the grand machine of state affairs who would think now monsieur le baron those little humble notes collected by me will have their part to play in directing and regulating the affairs of europe yes yes rascals generally seek to veil their mean and base practices beneath some high-sounding pretext but the notes you are to give me my dear baron have you them with you here they are drawn up precisely from the accounts furnished by m badinot pray let me hear them i am all attention m de graun then read as follows note relative to fleur de marie about the beginning of the year eighteen twenty seven a man named pierre tournemine then under sentence in the galleys at rochefort for forgery proposed to take a woman named gervais but also known as la chouette to take perpetual charge of a little girl then between five and six years of age for a sum of one thousand francs paid down the bargain being concluded the child was delivered over to the woman with whom she remained two years when unable longer to endure the cruelty shown her the little girl disappeared nor did the chouette hear anything of her for several years when she unexpectedly met with her at a small public-house in the cite nearly seven weeks ago the infant now grown into a young woman then bore the appellation of la goualeuse a few days previously to this meeting the above-mentioned tournemine who had become acquainted with the schoolmaster at the galleys of rochefort had sent to bras rouge the regular though concealed correspondent of every rogue and felon either in prison or out of it a lengthened detail of every particular relative to the child formerly confided to the woman gervais otherwise the chouette from this account and the declarations of the chouette it appeared that one madame seraphin housekeeper to a notary named jacques ferrand had in eighteen twenty seven instructed tournemine to find a person who for the sum of one thousand francs would be willing to take the entire charge of a child from five to six years of age whom it was desired to get rid of as has before been mentioned the chouette accepted the proposition and received both the child and the stipulated sum of money the aim of tournemine in addressing these particulars to bras rouge 
was to enable the latter to extort money from madame seraphin whom tournemine considered but as the agent of a third party under a threat of revealing the whole affair unless well paid for silence bras rouge entrusted the chouette long the established partner in all the schoolmaster's schemes of villainy and this explains how so important a document found its way to that monster's possession and also accounts for the expression used by the chouette at her rencontre with the goualeuse in the cabaret of the white rabbit when by way of tormenting her victim she said we have found out all about your parents but you shall never know who or what they are the point to be decided was as to the veracity of the circumstances detailed by tournemine in his letter to the chouette it has been ascertained that madame seraphin and the notary jacques ferrand are both living the address of the latter is rue du sentier number forty one where he passes for a person of pious and austere life at least he is constant in his attendance at church his attention to his professional duties close and severe though some accuse him of following up the severity of the law with unnecessary rigour in his mode of living he observes a parsimony bordering on avarice madame seraphin still resides with him as manager of his household and m jacques ferrand spite of his original poverty has invested thirty-five thousand francs in the funds the greatest part of this sum having been supplied to him through a m charles robert a superior officer of the national guard a young and handsome man in high repute with a certain class of society tis true that some ill-natured persons are found to assert that owing either to fortunate speculations or lucky hits upon the stock exchange undertaken in partnership with the above-mentioned charles robert the worthy notary could now well afford to pay back the original loan with high interest but the rigidly austere and self-denying life of this worthy man gives a flat denial to all such gossiping reports and spite of the incredulity with which he is occasionally listened to he persists in styling himself a man struggling for a maintenance there can be no manner of doubt but that madame seraphin this worthy gentleman's housekeeper could if she pleased throw an entire light upon every circumstance connected with la goualeuse bravo my dear baron exclaimed murphy nothing can be better these declarations of tournemine carry with them an appearance of truth and it seems more than probable that we may through jacques ferrand obtain the right clue to discovering the parents of this unfortunate girl now tell me have you been equally successful in the information collected touching the son of the schoolmaster perhaps as regards him i am not furnished with such minute particulars but upon the whole i think the result of our inquiries very satisfactory upon my word your m badinot is a downright treasure you see bras rouge is the hinge upon which everything turns m badinot who has several acquaintances in the police pointed him out to us as the go-between of several notorious felons and knew the man directly he was set to discover what had become of the ill-fated son of madame georges du renel the unfortunate wife of this atrocious schoolmaster and it was in going to search for bras rouge in his den in the cite rue aux fèves number thirteen that my lord fell in with the chourineur and la goualeuse his royal highness hoped too that the opportunity now before him of visiting these abodes of vice and wretchedness might afford him the means of rescuing some unfortunate being from the depths of guilt and misery his benevolent anticipations were gratified but at what risk is painful even to remember whatever dangers attended the scheme you at least my dear murphy bravely bore your share in them was not i for that very purpose appointed charcoal man in waiting upon his royal highness replied the squire smilingly say rather his intrepid bodyguard my worthy friend but to touch upon your courage and devotion is only to repeat what every one knows i will therefore spare your modesty and continue my relation here are the various particulars we have been able to glean concerning françois germain son of madame georges and the schoolmaster properly called durenel about eighteen months since a young man named françois germain arrived in paris from nantes where he had been employed in the banking-house of noel and company it seems both from the confession of the schoolmaster as well as from several letters found upon him that the scoundrel to whom he had entrusted his unfortunate offspring for the purpose of perverting his young mind and rendering him one day a worthy assistant to his unprincipled father in his nefarious schemes 
proposed to the young man to join in a plot for robbing his employers as well as to forge upon the firm to a considerable amount this proposition was received by the youth with well-merited indignation but unwilling to denounce the man by whom he had been brought up he first communicated anonymously to his master the designs projected against the bank and then privately quitted nantes that he might avoid the rage and fury of those whose sinful practices his soul sickened and shuddered to think of far less to bear the idea of participating in these wretches aware that they had betrayed themselves to the young man and dreading the use he might make of his information immediately upon finding he had quitted nantes followed him to paris with the most sinister intentions of silencing him for ever after long and persevering inquiries they succeeded in discovering his address but happily for the persecuted object of their search he had a few days previously encountered the villain who at first sought to corrupt his principles and well divining the motive which had brought him to paris lost no time in changing his abode and so for this time the schoolmaster's hapless son escaped his pursuers still however following up the scent they succeeded in tracing the youth to his fresh abode seventeen rue du temple one evening however he narrowly escaped falling into an ambush laid for him the schoolmaster concealed this circumstance from my lord but again providence prevented him and he escaped though too much alarmed to remain in his lodgings he once more changed his abode since which time all traces of him have been lost and matters had reached thus far when the schoolmaster received the just punishment of his crimes since which period by order of my lord fresh inquiries have been instituted of which the following is the result francois germain lived for about three months at number seventeen rue du temple a house rendered worthy of observation by the habits and ingenious practices of its inhabitants germain was a great favourite among them by reason of his kind and amiable disposition as well as for the frank gaiety of his temper although his means of livelihood appeared very slender yet he had rendered the most generous assistance to an indigent family occupying the garrets of the house in vain has been every inquiry made in the rue du temple touching the present residence of francois germain or the profession he was supposed to follow every one in the house believed him to be employed in some counting-house or office as he went out early in the morning and never returned till late in the evening the only person who really knows the present residence of the young man is a female lodging in the house number seventeen rue du temple a young and pretty grisette named rigolette between whom and germain a very close acquaintance appears to have existed she occupies the adjoining room to that which germain tenanted and which chamber by the by is still vacant and it was under the pretext of inquiring about it that these particulars were obtained rigolette exclaimed murphy after having been for several minutes apparently deep in thought yes i am sure i know her you sir walter murphy replied the baron much amused you most worthy and respectable father of a family you know anything of pretty grisettes and so the name of mademoiselle rigolette is familiar to you is it fie fie oh positively i am ashamed of you upon my soul my lord compel me to have so many strange acquaintances that such a mere trifle as this should pass for nothing but wait a bit yes now i recollect perfectly that when my lord was relating the history of la goualeuse i could not help laughing at the very odd name of rigolette which as far as i can call to mind was the name of a prison acquaintance of that poor fleur-de-marie well then just at this particular juncture mademoiselle rigolette may be of the utmost service to us let me conclude my report there might possibly be an advantage in engaging the vacant chamber recently belonging to germain in the rue du temple we have no instructions to proceed further in our investigations but from some words which escaped the portress there is every reason to believe that not only would it be possible to find in this house certain indications of where the schoolmaster's son may be heard of through the means of mademoiselle rigolette but the house itself would afford my lord an opportunity of studying human nature amid wants difficulties and misery the very existence of which he is far from suspecting thus you see my dear murphy said m de graun finishing his report and presenting it to his companion you see evidently that it is from the notary jacques ferrand we must hope to obtain information respecting the parentage of la goualeuse 
and that we must go to mademoiselle rigolette to trace the dwelling of françois germain it seems to me a great point to have ascertained the direction in which to search undoubtedly baron you are quite right and besides i am sure my lord will find a fine field for observation in the house of which you speak but i have not yet done with you have you made any inquiries respecting the marquis d'harville i have and so far as concerns money matters his royal highness's fears are wholly unfounded m badinot affirms and he is very likely to be well informed on the subject that the fortune of the marquis has never been in a more prosperous condition or better managed why after having in vain exhausted every other conjecture as to the secret grief which is preying upon m d'harville my lord imagined that it was just probable the marquis had some pecuniary difficulties had it proved so he would have removed them with that delicate assumption of mystery you know he so frequently employs to veil his munificence but since even this conjecture has failed he must abandon all hope of guessing the enigma and this he will do the more reluctantly as his great desire to discover it arose out of his ardent friendship for m d'harville a friendship which is founded on a grateful recollection of the important services rendered by the marquis's father to his own parent are you aware my dear murphy that at the remodelling of the states in eighteen fifteen at the germanic confederation the father of his royal highness had a chance of being excluded from his well-known attachment to napoleon thanks to the friendship with which the emperor alexander honoured him the deceased marquis d'harville was enabled to render most effectual service to the father of our patron the emperor whose warm regard for the late marquis had taken its date from the period of that nobleman's emigration to russia exerted his powerful influence in congress so successfully that at the grand meeting to decide the destinies of the princes of germany the father of our noble employer was reinstated in all his pristine rights as for the friendship now subsisting between the present marquis and his royal highness i believe it commenced when as mere boys they met together on a visit paid by the then reigning grand duke to the late marquis d'harville so i have heard and they appear to have retained a most lively recollection of this happy period of their youth nor is this all i have to say on the subject of the interest our noble master takes in every matter concerning the house of d'harville so profound is his gratitude for the services rendered to his father that all bearing the honoured name of d'harville or belonging to the family possess a powerful claim on the kindness of the prince thus not alone to her virtues or her misfortunes does poor madame georges owe the increasing and unwearied goodness of my lord madame georges exclaimed the astounded baron what the wife of duresnel the felon known as the schoolmaster and the mother of françois germain the youth we are seeking for and whom i trust we shall find is the relation of m d'harville she was his mother's cousin and her most intimate friend the old marquis entertained the most perfect friendship and esteem for madame georges but how for heaven's sake my dear murphy did it ever come about that the d'harville family ever permitted a descendant of theirs to marry such a monster as this duresnel why thus it was the father of this unfortunate woman was a m de lagny who previous to the revolution possessed considerable property in languedoc and who having fortunately escaped the proscription so fatal to many availed himself of the first tranquillity which succeeded these days of discord and anarchy to establish his only daughter in marriage among the various candidates for the hand of the young heiress was this duresnel the representative of a wealthy and respectable family possessing powerful parliamentary influence and concealing the depravity of his disposition beneath the most specious exterior to this man was mademoiselle de lagny united by desire of her father but a very short time sufficed to strip the mask from his vicious character and to display his natural propensities a gambler a spendthrift and profligate addicted to the lowest vices that can disgrace a human being he quickly dissipated not only his own fortune but that of his wife also even the estate to which madame georges duresnel had retired was involved in the general ruin occasioned by her worthless husband's passion for play and his dissolute mode of life and the unfortunate woman would have been left without a shelter for herself or infant son but for the kind affection of her relation the marquise d'harville whom she loved with the tenderness of a sister with this valued friend madame duresnel found a welcome home 
while her wretched husband finding himself utterly ruined plunged into the blackest crimes and stopped at no means however guilty and desperate to supply his pleasures he became the associate of thieves murderers pickpockets and forgers and ere long falling into the hands of the law was sentenced to the galleys for the term of his natural life yet while suffering the just punishment of his crimes his base mind devised the double atrocity of tearing the child from its miserable mother for the sake of breaking down every good principle it might have imbibed and of training it up in vicious readiness to join his future schemes of villainy you know the rest after the condemnation of her husband madame georges without giving any reason for doing so quitted the marquise d'harville and went to hide her shame and her sorrows in paris where she soon fell into the utmost distress it would occupy too much time to tell you by what train of events my lord became aware of the misfortunes of this excellent woman as well as the ties which connect her with the d'harville family it is sufficient that he came most opportunely and generously to her assistance induced her to quit paris and establish herself at the farm at bouqueval where she now is with the goualeuse in this peaceful retreat she has found tranquillity if not happiness and the overlooking and management of the farm may serve to recreate her thoughts and prevent them from dwelling too deeply on her past sorrows as much to spare the almost morbid sensibility of madame georges as because he dislikes to blazon forth his good deeds my lord has not even acquainted m d'harville with the fact of his having relieved his kinswoman from such severe distress i comprehend now the twofold interest which my lord has in desiring to discover the traces of the son of this poor woman you may also judge by that my dear baron of the affection which his royal highness bears to the whole family and how deep his vexation at seeing the young marquis so sad with so many reasons to be happy what can there be wanting to m d'harville he unites all birth fortune wit youth his wife is charming and as prudent as she is lovely true and his royal highness only had recourse to the inquiries we have been talking over after having in vain endeavoured to penetrate the cause of m d'harville's deep melancholy he showed himself deeply affected by the kind attentions of monseigneur but still has been entirely reserved on the subject of his low spirits it may be some peine de coeur yet it is said that he is excessively fond of his wife and she does not give him the least cause for jealousy i often meet her in society and although she is constantly surrounded by admirers as every young and lovely woman is still her reputation is unsullied the marquis is always speaking of her in the highest terms he has had however one little discussion with her on the subject of the countess sarah macgregor has she then seen her by a most unlucky chance the father of the marquis d'harville knew sarah satan of halsburg and her brother tom seventeen or eighteen years ago during their residence in paris and when they were much noticed by the lady of the english ambassador learning that the brother and sister were going into germany the old marquis gave them letters of introduction to the father of our noble lord with whom he kept up a constant correspondence alas my dear de Grone, perhaps but for these introductions many misfortunes would have been avoided for then monseigneur would not have known this woman when the countess sarah returned hither knowing the friendship of his royal highness for the marquis she presented herself at the hotel d'harville in the hope of meeting monseigneur for she shows as much pertinacity in pursuing him as he evinces resolution to avoid her only imagine her disguising herself in male attire and following him into the cité no woman but she would have dreamt of such a thing she perhaps hoped by such a step to touch his royal highness and compel him to an interview which he has always refused and avoided to return to madame d'harville her husband to whom monseigneur has spoken of sarah as she deserved has begged his wife to see her as seldom as possible but the young marquise seduced by the hypocritical flatteries of the countess has gone somewhat counter to the marquis's request some trifling differences have arisen but not of sufficient importance to cause or explain the extreme dejection of the marquis oh the women the women my dear murphy i am very sorry that madame d'harville should have formed any acquaintance with this sarah so young and charming a woman must suffer by the contact with such an infernal talking of infernal creatures said murphy here is a communication relative to cecily 
the unworthy spouse of the excellent david between ourselves my dear murphy this audacious metis well deserves the terrible punishment that her husband our dear black doctor has inflicted on the schoolmaster by monseigneur's order note nine metis the creole issue of a white and quadroon slave the metis only differ from the whites by some peculiarities hardly perceptible she has also shed blood and her unblushing infamy is astounding yet she is so very handsome so seductive a perverted mind within an attractive outside always inspires me with twofold disgust in this sense cecily is doubly hateful but i hope that this despatch annuls the last orders issued by monseigneur with regard to this wretched creature on the contrary baron my lord then desires that her escape from the fortress in which she had been shut up for life may be effected yes and that her pretended ravisher should bring her to france to paris yes and besides this despatch orders the arrangement to be carried out as soon as possible and that cecily be made to travel hither so speedily that she may arrive here in a fortnight i am lost in astonishment monseigneur has always evinced such a horror of her and that horror he still experiences if possible stronger than ever and yet he causes her to be sent to him to be sure it will always be easy to apprehend cecily again if she does not carry out what he requires of her orders are given to the son of the jailer of the fortress of gerolstein to carry her off as if he were enamoured of her and every facility will be given to him for effecting this purpose overjoyed at this opportunity of escaping the metisse will follow her supposed ravisher and reach paris then she will always have her sentence of condemnation hanging over her always be but an escaped prisoner and i shall be always ready when it shall please his royal highness to desire again to lay hands upon and incarcerate her i should tell you my dear baron that when david learned from monseigneur of the proposed arrival of cecily he was absolutely petrified and exclaimed i hope that your royal highness will not compel me to see the monster make yourself easy replied monseigneur you shall not see her but i may require her services for a particular purpose david felt relieved of an enormous weight off his mind nevertheless i am sure that some very painful reminiscences were awakened in his mind poor negro he loves her still they say too that she is yet so lovely charming too charming it requires the pitiless eye of a creole to detect the mixed blood in the all but imperceptible shade which lightly tinges her rosy finger-nails our fresh and hale beauties of the north have not a more transparent complexion nor a skin of more dazzling whiteness i was in france when monseigneur returned from america accompanied by david and cecily and i know that that excellent man was from that time attached to his royal highness by ties of the strongest gratitude but i never learned how he became attached to the service of our master and how he had married cecily whom i saw for the first time about a year after his marriage and god knows the scandal that followed i can tell you every particular that you may wish to learn my dear baron i accompanied monseigneur in his voyage to america when he rescued david and the metis from the most awful fate you are always most kind my dear murphy and i am all attention said the baron End of chapter 21